Uh, I'm Sebastian Tönes and I'm German. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, welcome. Welcome to the training school uh, on the uh, value of structural health monitoring information. Uh, that's exactly the topic uh, of the cost action we are having. Uh, we have been starting uh, yeah, late 2014. Basically, we have started in 2015. Um, there have been quite some uh, activities, uh, mainly uh, workshops, uh, conference sessions, uh, papers uh, we have been uh, working on. But uh, this is the first uh, training school on, uh, on this topic of uh, the value of structural health uh, monitoring information. So, um, what are we after? Um, we are uh, after the employment uh, of uh, Bayesian decision theory to the topic of uh, structural health monitoring. And the most powerful tool uh, we have in uh, Bayesian decision theory uh, is uh, pre-posterior decision analysis, which means uh, that I have pre-posterior knowledge which means uh, in the context of structural health monitoring that uh, I can model my uh, structural health monitoring data and if I can model them, I can find out what I can do with these data before I have it. And uh, if I can find out uh, for how to utilize these data I can optimize my SHM system and my data before implementation. So uh, this is what we are after. And <coughs> you are asked uh, to be able to perform a value of information analysis after the completion of this course. Uh, you should also be able to um, select appropriate decision analysis types and uh, meaning uh, or addressing uh, the pre-posterior decision analysis, that's one type, but there's also analysis types uh, on how uh, do I perform a uh, analysis uh, once I have my decision scenario and the decision tree. So this goes uh, to the uh, implementation of the analysis. And then uh, we are building upon in the Bayesian uh, decision analysis on uh, probabilistic models. <coughs> and uh, here um, we provide the background uh, that, uh, that you can develop uh, and apply probabilistic models. And these probabilistic models, uh, they are basically about modeling the relevant uncertainties we have, uh, where we have uh, limited precision in our models. When I'm talking about the precision of models, then we can take a mechanical model. If you go to reality, uh, there will be some differences between our mechanical model and, and the predictions we have and what we observe in, uh, in reality. And uh, the difference between these two is for instance called uh, model uncertainty. And then we also provide the basics of structural reliability analysis and uh, measurement information modeling. So this is basically the two models we are uh, connecting. It's the structural performance, how a, a structure behaves, uh, and uh, how does a measurement system uh, perform and uh, how they are interlinked. Okay, there's much more to tell. Um, but maybe a few words uh, to the setup. You all uh, have uh, got this, uh, this document, have received this document. And um, we are already in day two here. <coughs> so, 
So uh, this will be uh, our day today. Uh, there will be two more lectures. Uh, I'm doing the introduction and descriptive uh, statistics. Uh, Jochen sitting, Jochen Köhler, Professor Jochen Köhler sitting uh, behind. Uh, we'll take the uh, second part, probability theory fundamentals, and then probabilistic modeling uh, will be done by Professor John Das Katsyrenbrunn from Aalborg University. Uh, Jochen Köhler is from uh, the Norwegian Technical University at TNU. So uh, this will be our frame, basically, uh, for every day. It's three uh, lectures. Uh, it's quite, quite intense, uh, I presume. Uh, there are many, many topics. And uh, in the afternoon, you will have uh, some time to uh, basically work on your own. Uh, we will provide uh, exercises you can go through in the afternoon. Uh, you can do a self-study, you can do reading, you can do programming, you can ask us uh, if you want uh, a certain topic to have uh, more exercises on or to be elaborated again. So we will flexibly organize. So, and... Uh, Day two, that's, that will be uh, tomorrow, Tuesday. Uh, it's the three of us again, but in different order and on different topics. And we have in the evening uh, a training school dinner. And uh, on day three, I think this is the uh, most important day on the uh, Previous days we are building the fundamentals, the basics, and here we are going into the decision analysis from uh, different uh, perspectives, the Bayesian decision analysis, then uh, specifically on value of information, uh, two lectures. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, Carl Meiling sitting over there, uh, joined from uh, US, from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, together with uh, Matteo Pozzi. Uh, who will be on Skype. Uh, he could not be, be here today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, but I'm very happy uh, that we have also a lecture from you here. And uh, we will close then uh, this on uh, the training school on... Ah, there's closing remarks written. Yeah, it's of course not the closing of the training school, but it's the closing of the lectures. Um, and uh, the day four, um, that's, ah, uh, where are we? Oh, we have all these. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the day four, that's the Thursday. You will start to work on uh, your report task. Uh, we'll find out what that, uh, what that uh, exactly will be and how we organize. Um, and then uh, you have uh, supporters from the uh, uh, working groups of the cost action tier one forward. Okay, um, so this, this is an overview. Uh, before I'm starting the introduction lecture, Oh, we are quite many, but I think it's worth uh, that uh, that each, each of you uh, says a few words. Um, of course, the name, the affiliation, uh, and maybe a few words about value of information, what uh, you expect, uh, and what your background is, maybe. Um, okay, who wants to start? I'm a lecturer at, in England at the University of West of England, which is in Bristol, and I'm a senior lecturer doing bridge monitoring and uh, mainly work with masonry arch bridges, but monitor other types of bridges as well. Hi, I'm <laughs> Iris Consider. 
Uh, I'm a civil engineer and, uh, and a researcher in the University of West Virginia, working on monitoring bridges and other types of structure, structures, especially using accelerometers. Okay. Maybe you did. If you, <laughs> if you complete the first one, yes. yes. my name is Helder from Portugal. I work as a major consultancy for the IRS in Portugal, where we have some investments on monitoring. And we are looking forward to apply this in reality. So I'm interested mainly from the practical point of view. And uh, it's a quite valuable action and also training schools. I'm uh, I'm a PhD student at the Laboratory of uh, Risk and Signal Analysis at Politecnico de Milano. I have background in civil engineering, but now I'm studying at the energy department. I work at <coughs> condition-based uh, risk assessment. Hi, I'm Mamakler. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the University of Nantes. And uh, I work on the uh, special temporal optimization of uh, monitoring for uh, concrete structures, basically in marine and uh, temporal Hi, I'm Benjamin uh, from France. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working as a PhD student in the same laboratory as, uh, as uh, Romain. I'm working uh, on the monitoring of uh, marine lines for uh, floating wind turbines and so the, the structural reliability of those uh, marine lines. I'm Sophie Mahmoud uh, from Assistant Prof uh, Professor at the University of Belamont. I moved into uh, earthquake engineering, but I started recently in structural health monitoring, and I one of my expertise is in the field of decision analysis, so I'm trying now to see how uh, it can be applied to structural health monitoring. Thank you. So hello, my name is Monica, I'm from Slovakia. I'm a PhD student, I just started this September, and uh, my supervisor and a group of his other PhD students, they um, did some monitoring of uh, famous bridges in our capital city, and I would like to learn something more about the value of this information. Hi, I'm Mika, and uh, I'm working at the Technical University of Denmark. Working with is uh, structural health monitoring and value information related to structural health monitoring. So this workshop is quite relevant. Exactly relevant. Hi, my name is Tomasz Gajer. I'm a researcher at the University of Chino. I'm an Apple architect, <coughs> and I work on ship structures, but not specifically on this topic. Uh, hello, I'm Tomasz Gajer. I'm a PhD student at Krakow University of Technology, Poland. Uh, I'm working on application of optical fiber technology to monitor structure. But also I'm working in industry in company which implements structural health monitoring systems on variety type of structures in Poland. So that's it. Mm -hmm. I am Antonio Rucolo, I'm from I'm a PhD student from Polytechnic Milan. I am, have a background in civil engineering and I work on uh, uh, structural monitoring of uh, cultural heritage like uh, uh, towers uh, or bridges and so on. And so I'm interested in value information. Hi, I'm Dominic Di Francesco. I'm a PhD student at the University of Surrey. I've just started as well. But I've got a background in mechanical engineering and I'll be looking at the T models for offshore structures. My name is Walter Bolte. I'm from uh, Ghent University in Belgium. I'm currently finishing my PhD on structural robustness and how to have a structural robustness. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Marco Civera. I come from uh, Politecnico di Torino. Uh, I graduated as a civil engineer, but uh, I just started uh, officially four days ago my PhD in aerospace and so I'm Focusing on structural monitoring <coughs> and uh, linearities and um, air wings uh, and similar aircraft. Uh, <coughs> Hello, I'm Dominic. I'm working at the uh, University of Zagreb in Croatia. I'm in the bridge department and I'm dealing mainly with the assessment of existing bridges using bridge weighting motion 
Okay, so I'm interested in the structure of health monitoring and value of information. Hi, my name is Slav. I'm coming from the same university as Dominic, from the University of Zagreb. My main field are timber structures, but I have some experience in monitoring of uh, old structures and heritage buildings. So I uh, want to implement the knowledge from here to, to these kind of structures. My name is Wangi. I work at Alma uh, University in Denmark. Uh, I'm also a my name is Jochen Köhler, I'm from the University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, I'm a professor there in structural engineering in general, but my special interest is uh, applicable to uncertainty modeling and engineering. Uh, a current project related to uh, this uh, topic environment is uh, reliability assessment of moving lines and offshore platforms, bigger ones, and uh, also assessment of uh, uh, concrete bridges or road bridges. Uh, it's also maybe a topic I'm particularly interested in. Hello, uh, my name is Edwin uh, Bonaggi. I'm from uh, the Netherlands, the you know, uh, Research Institute. I work uh, in the Department of Structural Liability, and we, uh, we assess uh, the civil infrastructure uh, networks in the Netherlands in general, so bridges, roads, uh, tunnels, and so on. Uh, with respect to uh, work and mm -hmm. asset management and maintenance, uh, condition based as uh, but also as such, uh, very, very much interested in value of information. We get the uh, uh, monitoring more accepted also in asset management. Uh, Carl Mallings, uh, I recently completed my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. My advisor was Dr. Teo Pazzi. Uh, I'm going to be giving a lecture uh, later this week, uh, which is related to my research topic, which was using value of information to optimize the placement of sensors in large systems. Uh, hi, I'm Lisa Jagas. I'm also from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, I work at the Department of Structural Reliability as well, and I work in general all kinds of structural reliability, bridges, uh, yeah, roads, pipes, whatever. Hello, I'm Chiara, a PhD um, student from the University of Basilicata in the south of Italy. My research topic is the structural monitoring especially the uh, methods for damage uh, detection and the localization on uh, important concrete grain structures. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Pistone. I'm working for Vienna Consulting Engineering, and my field of expertise and interest is in the structure of monitoring of bridges, offshore structures, and railways. Uh, my name is Claudia <coughs> Neves, and uh, I'm a PhD at KTH Stockholm. Um, I've been pretty much till now work with machine learning uh, techniques applied to monitoring of bridges. Um, so pretty much developing algorithms that can look at the, at the measurements on a bridge, and from there uh, we can kind of automatically assess if the bridge is damaged or not. And of course we have these uh, kind of false diagnoses, and so um, at this point I would like to turn my research into the value of information. Uh, I am Maria Pinali Mongelli, I'm an associate professor at the Polytechnic of Milan and part-time uh, visiting professor at IFSTAR in France. And I work uh, mainly on structural health monitoring. Uh, uh, the specific field is damage detection and uh, uh, localization. And uh, since uh, I been participating to this construction. Uh, now I'm starting to work on the management of the emergency uh, and the value of information from structural monitoring for the management of uh, seismic emergency. Okay. Hello everybody, I'm Arizona Mosotta. I'm Italian, but I work as a postdoc researcher at the University of Vigna in Portugal. And uh, I mainly, my research mainly focuses on uh, damage identification and structural monitoring of, his, of historic measuring structures. So I'm looking forward to learn uh, in this school 
something more about the value of information so that I can apply to the heritage building. Um, hi everybody, I am Jorge, I come from Spain, and I recently started a PhD uh, at the NTU in front of him, uh, supervised by Jochen. And the value of information is going to be one of the main parts of my uh, PhD thesis. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Jan Mochov, uh, I came from Prague, uh, so I'm a PhD studi uh, student uh, in Czech Technical University, Google Institute. Uh, I work in the Department of Structural Reliability, so my uh, topic of my research is uh, monitoring and uh, optimizing, uh, optimizing of structure in industry like uh, wind towers and uh, chimneys. Hello everyone, my name is Ivan Zambon. I'm doing a PhD in Vienna, Austria at University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences with the topic of uh, assessment of existing concrete bridges um, and uh, with the emphasis of um, bridges in networks. Hello, I'm Filippo Salobianetis. I'm uh, currently finishing my PhD in Cyprus, the University of Cyprus. Uh, my topic is mainly about uh, uh, predicting the time to rehabilitation of bridges uh, for the different type of bridges that exist. So, of course, the value of information is of uh, a major issue. Uh, and I'm using the National Bridge Inventory of the U.S. to perform this study. Hello, everyone. My name is Vijay Vijalo. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Federal Institute of Material Testing and Research in Berlin. And my PhD topic is about quantification of value information for vitality structures. So I'm dealing with bridges and wind turbines. And Sebastian is my supervisor. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sima. I'm from Alborg University, working uh, with John uh, Gosta Solanson. And uh, I'm uh, also look, uh, in my PhD looking uh, for risk assessments of wind turbines and bridges. So this course will give me a lot of value. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> we got uh, this nice equipment here. So let's start the first lecture. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot to talk about uh, or for an introduction. Uh, here we have a scheme uh, which we <coughs> which is hopefully better visible in the next uh, slide, <coughs> uh, which uh, is one of the um, results already uh, of the research work we have already performed uh, in the course section. And it has also been published. Uh, so this is the references. Here we have it. Um, we have it larger. But not large enough. Um, Maybe we can switch it to the A few centimeters here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good idea. Thanks, Carl. You <coughs> may zoom in then uh, to one or two uh, yeah, on the slides. Anyway, um, what you can uh, recognize here is that we have a desktop model and we have the actual structure. So uh, this is uh, one of the basic. Um, things we have to be uh, aware of, it's reality and it's, it's our models. Um, and um, and in our models, um, there's uh, this side here, the input is uh, that we can change the system by, uh, by repair action, maintenance actions, um, and also uh, renewal of the systems. Uh, and uh, from 
our actual structure from our reality, uh, the environment, uh, we, uh, the structure will uh, experience exposures um, and also in terms of uh, risk analysis, it may be vulnerable, it may have a limited robustness. <coughs> So um, these ex, uh, exposures are uh, modeled, so they find it, uh, their way to our desktop model. Um, and uh, here we have the part where we can uh, collect information. Uh, here are basically the strategies for monitoring, inspections, and uh, choice of indicators, technologies. And they are all uh, going in here being indicators um, because we have a measurement basically referring to our actual uh, structural behavior. So it will come over indicators and observations into uh, our models. And uh, from the observations, uh, there may be, but we basically have to find out, uh, there may be decision rules um, on with what observation uh, we have here. Uh, which action uh, should we do here, uh, meaning uh, repair, maintenance. And then uh, we, can, uh, we can optimize in terms of uh, reliability, availability, uh, risk reduction, life cycle costs, uh, and uh, resilience. So this part or this scheme uh, will always come back to us. Uh, I hope in the future in higher resolution. Um, and this is again uh, the uh, day one. Uh, here we are talking about the probabilistic fundamentals and modeling. So that's basically the background uh, for, for the scheme. Uh, on day two, we will uh, focus on the uh, structural reliability that's basically uh, modeling the uh, yeah, modeling the structure and the performance of the structure. And here we have um, a basic scheme for risk analysis. So we may have exposures, uh, that's what we had here also. Uh, and then uh, we may have direct consequences due to damage uh, of a system component, but there may also be uh, then consecutively uh, indirect consequences. Uh, they are arising from the functionality loss of the structure. So uh, we are focusing on this part. Uh, we will talk uh, then also on uh, how to collect information and how to model uh, indicators and, uh, and observations so that they can uh, actually affect uh, this model. And this is basically the part of the, of the third uh, lecture. So we are going from um, structural reliability analysis, uh, that's usually referring to one component, to structural systems having more components, and then uh, we are talking about the collection of information and modeling this information so that uh, it can be uh, feed in uh, our structural reliability models or the structural reliability models can be updated. So that's uh, our second day, and the third day is the decision analysis. That's basically uh, the complete frame. Uh, and. Uh, we will have an introduction and, uh, and the Bayesian decision analysis, and then, uh, I said this already, value of information analysis uh, from two perspectives. So, um, and this is, this is the lecture today. Uh, this is the uh, introduction, and uh, we call it descriptive uh, statistics or um, elementary data analysis. So uh, we, we look at uh, how we can uh, describe data statistically uh, by means of uh, numerical and a graphical description. And also how to, uh, 
how to describe data pairs. This will be, for uh, a few of you, this will be very uh, familiar, but provides uh, the uh, background uh, we need here for this lecture. So we have uh, one hour for that. Um, maybe I cannot go through all in through all the detail, but uh, I will focus on some very relevant aspects. Um, so, elementary data analysis. Uh, so we um, do I have the next slide? Yeah. So we have. Uh, you may have here some numbers, uh, and uh, this is not good for communication. This cloud here of numbers. So that's why we need uh, <coughs> some concepts we all know how to describe the data. And what these uh, data you have just seen, uh, this, I think this is even a concrete compressive uh, strength here. Um, and, uh, but it can be all kinds of other uh, data, uh, any material strength data basically, uh, but also related to uh, natural hazard fluid and uh, flood and uh, sea level data or snow height uh, data, for instance. So, when I'm coming from the data, um, I think this is what we uh, what we should have in mind here. Uh, I'm now. I already uh, have uh, data now. Uh, that means I have uh, observations. Uh, and then I can uh, simply describe them with the with the mean. Uh, it's the sample, uh, so it comes from the data. A sample mean, uh, a sample median. So that's the value corresponding to the 0.5 quantile we will see in a few moments, uh, and also the most, the most frequent value. And this is called central measures. So I'm measuring uh, the central information content of my data. Mean, median, mode, three different uh, things. So, uh, and then uh, I have an information about the central content of my data, but there's data around. And how do I describe them? Uh, that's dispersion measures. So I have a sample range. Uh, that's the easiest measure, so the minimum and the maximum. That's, uh, that's the most easy measure. Uh, I have a variance um, and standard deviation. So this sounds uh, probably very familiar to uh, most, uh, most of you. And uh, coefficient of uh, variation. So here, um, this measure is basically relating a dispersion measure to a central measure by uh, the variability relative to the sample mean. So that's the uh, coefficient of uh, variation. So uh, there's a difference. Uh, so there's often a mistake. Uh, uh, there's a difference in the variance and the coefficient of variation. And um, there's also shape measures. So how do my data look like? And that's or we will see this uh, in the picture at the meeting soon, uh, very clearly. Uh, but here is the definitions of the skewness and the kurtosis. That it uh, looks very similar to uh, what we have here for the sample variance. Oh, still, the resolution is not so good, uh, but there's a square here, uh, two there. And if we have uh, very similar expression, and we have a tree here and a tree also here. So this is the uh, shape measures called skewness and the kurtosis. Uh, the skewness is uh, yeah, how misaligned uh, the, the, sh the, the shape of the data is, and the kurtosis is about the peakiness. But we will see. So central measures, dispersion measures, uh, shape measures. And that's an, um, 
that's our concrete uh, compressive uh, strength. Here it is unordered, uh, here it is ordered. And uh, this is a one dimensional scatter plot. So that's already uh, graphical data description. So that's the simplest uh, thing we can do with one dimensional data. It's a scatter plot. And uh, we, we then see the range from 24 to uh, almost 40 or a little higher. So I think it's 25 here. And we can already guess the mean here of the data. Um, graphical description uh, to be uh, added, uh, we can do histograms. Uh, when we do histograms, we uh, need basically uh, intervals uh, where we input the data and we count the data in this uh, interval. So we define an interval here from 23 to 26. Uh, we have one observation in here uh, and if you related to the overall uh, observations, uh, this will give uh, a frequency. And then we can also add the uh, frequencies and then we have the cumulative uh, frequency. Okay, uh, and this is how it looks like. Um, okay, this is the two examples, um, and we have, um, okay, and of, we can plot the same, the same data uh, with uh, different intervals, and we see that uh, here the information content is obviously not as high as, uh, as here. So uh, when we do a histogram, uh, we need to have a look at, uh, at the interval uh, to see that the interval uh, provides us a uh, meaningful way of representation. This is a cumulative frequency plot. So we had it in the, we had it in the last uh, uh, column of the, of the table. OK, uh, so this is some very basic uh, concepts of how to describe the data uh, by uh, means of numerical concepts, uh, central dispersion measures, shape measures, and uh, very similar concepts uh, for the graphical representation. <coughs> so where is that relevant? It's, uh, it's relevant for, for instance, uh, for the distribution of the um, <coughs> of concrete uh, aggregates, so this is uh, basically a, uh, a commutative frequency plot uh, of uh, concrete aggregates, <coughs> and uh, here we have the the sizes of the aggregates, and then they have uh, different curves, and if you mix concrete. Uh, you need to be aware that you have the right distribution, otherwise all things of uh, problems can occur um, to the mixture, but also to the uh, concrete pouring. Uh, so if, you, if the reinforcement is too dense uh, and uh, you have uh, quite some uh, grains which uh, with a high, uh, with a large size, uh, then uh, your concrete gets uh, stuck and just doesn't go through the reinforcement. <coughs> okay, this was one uh, example where we uh, need obviously the graphical uh, data description. Is there an example which is even more relevant than this one? Where we need the uh, distribution of uh, grain sizes. examples? Or, of course, there are many uh, examples on our structures. We can measure uh, strains, and we, uh, we may have a histogram of the strain observations, right? <coughs> but what is more rele relevant?
coffee. <laughs> so <clears throat> here we have um, the uh, histogram of the grain distribution uh, of coffee, of grinded coffee for a filter holder machine like this. I think that's an uh, E61 uh, brewing unit. So. Um, We, uh, we have here a two-peaked um, histogram. We have one peak here, um, so that's uh, that's microns. So that's uh, yeah, that's in, in microns, and this is about uh, 70 or 80 microns. There's one peak, and then there is other peaks, and this is two uh, or three different um, grinding coffee grinders and they all have the same peak here anybody knows uh, where, where that is relevant for so it's obvious that the, the peak here uh, it's exactly at the same location uh, only the density is uh, is varying whereas the second peak you see that uh, the uh, yeah that the peak is not exactly uh, at one location and the shape is uh, more different uh, than here. So uh, the first peak uh, is for taking the, the pressure out because uh, the pressure here will be around 10 bars. Uh, the 10 bars uh, water will come and then if the coffee drops out, the pressure is zero. So the first peak uh, is about taking the pressure away. And the second peak here, uh, this is about the taste. And of course, uh, a grinder only functions uh, if this peak is there, right? Otherwise, you cannot pour it to the coffee pot. Okay, this was a relevant example for the application of uh, statistical data description. Um, <coughs> We can also introduce uh, the concept of quantiles. So uh, a quantile is, um, is calculated uh, with the ordered data. Uh, by the way, uh, I've sent just before the lecture, I think uh, I was able to get out the email sending you the lecture slides. So you should have it uh, on your uh, computer already. Um, and we will try to solve the resolution problem in the next, uh, for the next lecture. So you take the ordered set of data and then you uh, calculate the quantile with the number of the data and uh, or the overall number of the data n and the number, the ordered number here and then you can assign the quantile. <coughs> And uh, per definition, um, we saw it in one of the first slides, uh, the median is defined as the 0.5 uh, quantile value. So if you have a quantile plot, you can read uh, the median. Uh, another graphical representation uh, is the QK box plot. Uh, so this is the most informative plot uh, we are seeing today uh, because it contains uh, quite a few elements here in the plot. For instance, we, um, we have an indication of the, uh, of, the range, of the range with the upper adjacent uh, value and the lower adjacent value and that's uh, referring to the quantiles, uh, the 0.7 five quantile plus 1.5 times the data range, and the range was the minimum and the maximum value. So this is uh, how this is defined, and there may be even values outside, uh, because uh, this is not the maximum of the data, and this is not the minimum, but uh, it refers to the quantile and the data range. So <coughs> uh, we have here the upper quartile. The upper quartile is basically the uh, 0.75 uh, 
5 quartile and here the uh, lower quartile and we have a median indication here. And R uh, is our interquartile range. So that's where 50% of the data lie. So for uh, our uh, concrete compressive uh, strength data, the uh, 2K box plot looks like this. We have a median of uh, 33, uh, and we have a range indication here. We, we don't have outside values. There's no uh, data lying outside. And our upper Edison value is uh, 39.7 and uh, the lower one is 24.4. <coughs> so, um, the elements of graphical data description is uh, one-dimensional scatter plots, it's, uh, it's histograms, uh, quantile plots and uh, 2K box plots. Uh, so these are the main elements. There are many more uh, representations, uh, but I think this is quite good. Yeah. So uh, now let's talk about uh, how to describe <laughs> the uh, data sets. Now we have uh, observations of, uh, of two random uh, variables, or two data. Random variable is the uh, mathematical concept. Uh, we will come later today, or uh, we will get to this later today. So we have uh, x observations and y observations, and here uh, we have observation one, and we observed this x value and this uh, y value if this was observation one. So that's a scatter plot. Uh, what can we take out of uh, this uh, plot here? Is this a correlation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, what is the correlation? Yeah, no correlation. Yeah, yeah, you already know. Um, okay, so, but uh, here basically uh, I have the same uh, number of observations uh, for X and Y. Uh, if I don't have the same number, uh, what am I doing then? Anybody has an idea? It was already on the slide, but maybe the resolution wasn't high enough. You do a QQ plot. So um, here, uh, well, this is a table here where um, <coughs> You have uh, all that observation uh, for x and all that observation for y, uh, and then you uh, calculate the quantiles for each, and then you can create a QQ plot. So <coughs> you don't plot the uh, value of the observation, but you plot the quantile, and then you have a QQ plot, a quantile, quantile plot. Uh, and uh, then you can also conclude on the uh, distribution uh, of, um, of the data you have at hand. So if this was uh, number of cars in one direction and this in the other direction, if there's, uh, if there, well, this is the QQ data, this is a straight line, and um, if the uh, Plot results in uh, one line, then the dis distributions are uh, identical. Okay, so this is for uh, multiple data. And then uh, 
there is also some numerical concepts on uh, how to describe two sets of data. Uh, so we have here the concept of the sample uh, covariance and the coefficient of correlation. It's uh, very similar to the uh, one-dimensional data analysis. Uh, so uh, this is basically uh, the variance if uh, a y uh, was equal to x. Then, then you have the variance if you have two uh, data sets, uh, x and y, uh, then you have the covariance. So cxy. cxy is here, and if you divide it by uh, the, uh, I think this was the symbol for the standard, standard deviation of x, uh, and this is the standard deviation of y, you have the uh, correlation. We will need this uh, in the lecture tree on day two, so tomorrow. We will come back to this. So uh, the basically the uh, covariance has the same uh, information content <coughs> like the correlation. But the correlation is normalized, and it's normalized by the standard deviations. So what is the range of uh, correlations? Minus one minus one. Yes. And if we, uh, if we calculate yeah, the coefficient of correlation like this, is it linear or nonlinear coefficient of correlation? Yes, it's the linear coefficient of correlation. <coughs> uh, what do I have in my slides? <coughs> okay, we can do it. So there's, uh, what is the uh, coefficient of correlation, approximately? Close to one. Okay, this uh, this is uh, this is right, but uh, okay. I, I will draw a straight line, as straight as I can draw a line. So this is a straight line, right? Or it could lie uh, even a little here. Um, but this looks uh, more like like curve. look rather like this, right? So uh, it will be close to one, let's say it will, will be 0. Point, let's say 0. 0.9. Mm -hmm. uh, if I take the linear coefficient of correlation. How can I identify or the point here is that I'm identifying the linear dependency of, uh, of these data here and here. So in a mechanical model, where do I find the, uh, where do I have linear dependencies? Please? Yeah, yeah. So what, could, uh, what example could that be? Yeah, yeah, it's a linear elastic zone, and if I'm taking uh, measurements of the uh, of the deflection and and the uh, at the load, then uh, I would have this relation. So that means uh, uh, I can model my dependencies directly uh, with a mechanical model, the linear elastic model. But if I don't uh, model the dependencies uh, by this mechanical model, I can model them statistically with the correlation. 
So in, uh, if you do statistical concepts in engineering, we uh, should know the underlying models. And if you know that uh, there is a mechanical model uh, underlying this, uh, this data, uh, then we have the explanation uh, for, the, for the dependency. And if we just see the data and we analyze the correlation like we do it here, then we can identify with this coefficient of correlation the linear R uh, dependencies. How do I identify the nonlinear dependencies? like the uh, dash line here. Yes? By transformation and data, make it here? Uh, yes, uh, but... And the uh, logo... Okay. Yeah. If there is logo. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very good idea, to transform it to linear uh, data. So you have nonlinear data, you transform to linear data. And uh, well, the idea had uh, someone before you, uh, and uh, this guy was called Spamman. And Spamman introduced the Spamman rank correlation. And here, uh, with the Spamman rank correlation, your linear, <coughs> linear rising the data uh, in a way that um, so mathematically written, uh, it's simply that uh, there is uh, a rank operation operator here, here and here. And uh, by transferring uh, the data into ranks, uh, it's a very simple, most simple uh, linearization. Uh, uh, if you, um, yeah, that's basically the Spearman rank coefficient of, uh, of correlation. So, um, and then <coughs> with the Spearman rank coefficient of correlation, you will identify the um, nonlinear dependencies. And then, uh, so this means the uh, The nonlinear coefficient of correlation will be, oh, it's a little scattered, so let's say it's uh, 0 0.95. And uh, the linear coefficient of correlation, let's say it will be 0 0.85. It will be lower. Because with this one, you are identifying only the linear information content, and with this one, the nonlinear coefficient. Uh, um, nonlinear coefficient of correlation, the nonlinear uh, dependencies. So let's have a look to, um, to these examples. Um, so well, this is straightforward for the linear coefficient of correlation, and that's written on the slide. Um, but let's think of um, of this one. So. Suppose it's x, uh, it's a y-axis and an x-axis here. And uh, how large is the nonlinear coefficient of correlation? An estimation. What would that be? Can you see? Because of this. Yes, okay, uh, there may be something in it, but it's not the symmetry, or maybe, yeah, maybe. it goes to the summary, uh, symmetry, um, that's right. Uh, any other opinions? It looks like a function. Yeah. It's close to one. It should be close to one. Because there is a clear dependency between yeah. Okay, but this uh, linearization operation uh, by Spamman, uh, maybe it's worth uh, 
to consider other linearization uh, operations, but the, uh, what Spelman does, or what the Spelman rank coefficient of correlation does, is uh, it only identifies B unique dependencies. So only for one X value, there's mm. one Y value. <laughs> but if you have symmetry, or if you have a curve like, uh, like this, you don't have a B unique uh, dependency. So uh, here uh, you would need other uh, statistical measures to identify the uh, dependencies. You cannot do this with the linear coefficient of correlation or the nonlinear coefficient of correlation. And uh, again, for the coefficient of correlation, we need a relevant example. What could that be? Mechanical models. Any ideas what that could what else that could be? Turbines. Uh, here we have a complex uh, interrelation from, from the wind speed, and then uh, by aerodynamics it's transferred to, this, to the structure and to the turning of the wind turbine and the energy production. And then there's uh, all kinds of uh, mechanical systems introducing the loads uh, in the structure. So here uh, the models are very complex, uh, and you cannot uh, know ex. Yeah, from the beginning uh, what the correlation of the data uh, will be and what effects will dominate, dominate over the other effects. So I think this is a very good example. Uh, so here statistical uh, data analysis uh, is sometimes really necessary and we will see also in uh, lecture three of day two um, even with uh, simple uh, probabilistic models uh, and some random variables have a full correlation, some are defined as being uncorrelated. But what is the correlation of the limit state then? Uh, so this is not so easy. Uh, we can do this lecture three uh, on day two. Um, okay, uh, I give you a relevant example. Um, so it's the relationship between the stock population and the birth rates. So there has been a um, data analysis on uh, the number of uh, stock breeding pairs and uh, the birth rates. Um, what is that? Thousands uh, per year. That's the birth rate in uh, in a region. In a region, and there is a scientific publication about it. Uh, and we see uh, it's correlated. Yeah, there is a dependency. But there's also uh, here again we have the number, or here we have the number of stock breeding pairs, and here we have the land area. So there's also a dependency of. Uh, if the land area was large, uh, then the number of the stock breeding pairs is, is large. And uh, of course, uh, there is uh, a birth rate which is also dependent on the uh, land area. Right. So uh, I think this illustrates uh, what we have been discussing about before. Uh, we are engineering, uh, we, have, um, we have, for instance, mechanical models where we know uh, that uh, if uh, two sets of data are reproduced by a mechanical model, then we know by the mechanical model what uh, the correlation, the dependency should be. So, but 
uh, we see already with the example of wind turbines, uh, this is also an engineering system, but it's, uh, it's a very complex system, much more complex than, than a building or a bridge, because it's uh, basically a, a, a machine. Um, here we already see that we cannot really know in advance the dependencies uh, of uh, the data which we, which we get. Uh, and then, okay, for uh, this kind of uh, data analysis, um, uh, the underlying uh, dependencies um, are unclear, um, and uh, we cannot conclude basically on uh, on the dependencies by by the data analysis. We know that there is a dependency, but we don't really know where it comes from unless we have a model uh, for reproducing this data. So, so the most important things for the uh, data pair description uh, is uh, that we uh, have numerical measures, it's the sample covariance or the, uh, yeah, which is re closely related uh, to the variance. And we have the coefficient of correlation, which can be simply uh, calculated out of the uh, <coughs> covariance. Um, what uh, we had in the lecture, uh, we cannot identify uh, nonlinear dependencies. We can identify B unique uh, nonlinear dependencies with the Spellman rank coefficient of correlation. And uh, yeah, we have these uh, scatter plots and QQ plots to compare uh, the uh, data or the uh, distributions. So, um, we need the uh, elementary data analysis uh, that we have a common understanding on how to uh, describe the, da the data and to communicate. I think uh, we have here in the room uh, quite some SHM engineers uh, or SHM researchers. Um, but the essential thing uh, in the cost action and on the topic of information uh, is that we, uh, that we cover both the uh, SHM engineering and modeling uh, and the structural engineering and modeling. We need both. Uh, and this is what the lectures are, uh, are about. Uh, and at least between these two domains, we need to communicate. Um, this goes to the data analysis, but uh, this goes to more specific concepts than uh, like the probability of indication, for instance. With the uh, probability of indication, um, you have, uh, that's basically uh, a probability um, related to uh, damage size and uh, how good you are able to uh, identify uh, this damage size with your uh, structural health monitoring uh, system and algorithm. And if you have, uh, if you have a probability of indication, uh, then uh, there's a very clear way of uh, how to update uh, the structural performance. And uh, this is a more specific mean of communication between these two fields. Um, the uh, SHM engineering and the structural uh, engineering. So, um, yeah, I think that's the contents. Okay, and then we uh, we have the task uh, for this lecture in the afternoon, and that's uh, basically going through the self-assessment of chapter three in the uh, uh, in the book of Michael Faber. Statistics and probability theory and pursuit of engineering decision support.
So please uh, do this in the afternoon. Uh, there will also be a lecture uh, route. And it can be, I think, in this room. And uh, yeah, we will tell you uh, whether there is uh, other rooms available so that you may work with some Can rooms. you just ask about this yep. book? Where, where do we get the book? Pardon? Where do we get the book? <laughs> How do we get access to the chapters, right? If you don't have it, I no. should set it in the center not around. Yeah, it was a lecture plan, uh, or in the, yeah, the uh, training school plan. Um, yeah. Are we meant to have it here? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I said it around. Okay. okay. Um, so that's... Uh, the basic contents, uh, it's, it starts uh, for this lecture, it starts easy, uh, but uh, there will be a lot more and uh, a lot of easy, of easy things uh, may also become a little complex. So maybe we um, we go to our Uh, we could discuss something uh, something else. Um, so we have the data analysis. So uh, I've shown you the scheme. I, uh, if you load the lecture slides, uh, you should also have in the afternoon a uh, um, closer look to the scheme. So this was, uh, was the first slides here. And uh, let's talk about uh, the uh, basic elements of a value of information analysis. And we do this, um, yeah, we do it together. Some of you uh, know, but uh, most of you don't, I suppose. So what do we need uh, if we want to do, if we want to assess the value of uh, structural health mode? What elements do we have? Give me elements. We need an event. Event. That causes event. consequences. do we need? We need monitoring data to assess the value of monitoring okay. data. Thank you for this point. This is a very, very important point, uh, but it's a little different. Uh, so we need uh, basically, uh, how to say, uh, we need an SHM system and analysis, data analysis. But we don't need data. So this was uh, my comment or my saying in the very beginning. We have a pre-posterior uh, decision analysis. Uh, value of information analysis, a pre-posterior decision analysis. Uh, okay, I want to make this point very uh, clearly. Um, but we may take something else out of the data. But um, okay, we don't need uh, the SHM data, but we need to know uh, to model what SHM data we may obtain. Distribution. Distributions. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, they, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay.
Okay, we need distributions, uh, and you thought of the ASHM? Yeah. Okay, we need uh, to uh, somehow predict uh, the ASHM data, but this will be uncertain. So that's why uh, our prediction uh, will be a distribution. So, um, yeah. So that's uh, probability distributions. Yeah, but we have to be aware that the first line, the event that leads yep. to consequences, this is the one side of the analysis. And now we switch to the other side, which is the yep. structural health monitoring. This is the more or less traditional way to think for engineers, right? First think about the measurements. But we have to be aware that we have to represent an event that leads to consequences. Yep. The, uh, the prediction of this uh, outcome of the event is associated with uncertainties. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the results of the SHM should be related to these uncertainties or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's important. Yes. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, so th this is the, the way we will, uh, the steps we will take uh, in today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. <clears throat> but let's be a little more basic. Uh, so, okay, this probability distributions we find here for the SHM uh, outcomes. Yeah, we need outcomes. But uh, of course, our probability distributions uh, are also uh, for the uh, events here. So, this is basically. Uh, the day of today, our underlying uh, probabilistic models. And there, these probability distributions, as one major mean of uh, probabilistic modeling, they are underlying the complete analysis. So we need uh, SHM and event outcomes. Um, what else do we need? Actions, Actions yep. And, okay, what else? So let's uh, think in the direction that we would like to, um, uh, maybe we need one more, more element here. Um, So I said uh, there are many uh, of you who have been uh, working with SHM systems and data, but uh, the basic other uh, discipline we know is what? Structure. A structure, a structural system. Okay, we have now um, four main points uh, we need in a value of information analysis. Now I'm asking uh, how can we uh, work with all these elements? Connect us. Probability tree. Probability tree. Uh, yes, something. This goes in the right tree. direction. Pardon? An event tree. Yeah, or a decision tree. Decision tree. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to define a decision scenario out of it. 
so that we uh, that we have our system. We know what we can do. This can be uh, repair or maintenance actions. Um, and to the structural system, uh, there may be an event which causes consequences, like the failure. So any structural uh, assessment design is against failure. So that's the, our limit state functions. OK, so we have structural system actions. Uh, we can uh, describe the structural performance with uh, events and consequences. And then we have uh, SHM. And uh, how is that connected now to these elements? Well, SHM should uh, give me information about the status, the, the condition of the structure. Yeah. And so maybe hints uh, understand which event could be more probable than the other. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. This this is the right keyword. Uh, SHM is connected to the structural system performance and it should uh, somehow give uh, more information about the events with the consequences. Yeah, this is very good. Okay. So, and this uh, basically goes in a uh, decision tree. And we should also introduce here the uh, decision uh, scenario, where the decision tree is uh, part of it. And then um, we could also ask, uh, OK, we do a decision analyze. But what are we deciding? We may be deciding if it's a if it's a valuable to use the SHM system, or we may be deciding yeah. between SHM different SHM yeah. strategies. Yeah. So this is our decisions. Uh, okay. Maybe the ones who know uh, stay a little quiet. Uh, because uh, to engage uh, all the others who may not know already. Okay, we decide with the value of information analysis uh, about the SHM system. So this is very straight uh, forward. This is the value of SHM information about. Uh, what else uh, do we decide? <coughs> yeah. Where was it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you already know. <laughs> oh no, uh, here, this is the actions. Okay. So, uh, we are deciding uh, about an optimal action with SHM data and what the best SHM system uh, <coughs> would be available for this decision. Everybody knows what that is? So if I would like to model actions, 
uh, or SHM, then I use a rectangular node, and that's uh, that's a decision node. So that means uh, that uh, here we have other nodes uh, about the structural system performance. and the SHM outcomes. This is chance nodes. Uh, this, is, um, this is associated to uh, probabilistic models. And this is uh, related to the uh, decisions. So I've, uh, I've now built the uh, very basic uh, decision tree for a value of information analysis. We have here the uh, SHM system or strategy because it's also the data analysis and all elements we need uh, to obtain information. So this is the SHM outcomes. Uh, so this is our, uh, this describes how we do the SHM with what technology, uh, as I said, and uh, what data analysis. Uh, it's rather describing and uh, different kinds of uh, of the strategy, and then it's uh, the SHM outcomes. So that could be uh, an uh, indication of damage. It's then the uh, actions. So this is our decision node here. And this is the structural performance. That's the value of SHM analysis. This is what, what we are after. Yes, please. Hmm? Aren't even some consequences of the reason all events that cause the failure or any kind of the consequences also the For example, tree consequences of the environment. Okay. So this is uh, a question about uh, the consequences. What can be consequences? We uh, note that we don't see uh, the consequences here in the decision tree, right? Yeah. That's the actions and the uh, probabilities. Uh, there's branches, uh, we will and and uh, um, and it's uh, it's events. So here uh, there are events. And they should be related to the consequences. What can be consequences for a decision analysis? So we can also brainstorm on that. You say. But uh, you already have an idea. Yeah. Uh, you I say one. But what, what can be consequences? Oh, yes. uh, ah, you mean money or fatality or uh, yeah, okay. the yes. environmental? Consequences can be uh, monetary risks. Um, this is what we are, uh, right, as structural engineers, uh, mostly are dealing with. Uh, it's the uh, monetary consequences, so the fail of the structure. But what happens also if the structure fails? What consequences? Do we have Yes. It's injuries, it's uh, loss of lives. So there can be uh, very high consequences. Um, okay. So uh, if, you th if you think of a bridge, and uh, let's say the bridge um, is uh, severely damaged, it's, uh, it's not collapsing, but it's severely damaged, uh, what consequences do we have? in this situation. 
Yeah, it can only cover consequences if it uh, connects uh, to, for yeah. example, uh, a shop and the production center. Yeah. So uh, there will be road closures, uh, there will be traffic diversions. Uh, so this causes economic consequences. And then uh, the repair action also uh, causes consequences. Okay, and if we, uh, we, have, we have a few in the room uh, who are working with offshore structures, uh, what can, yeah, there's another a very basic type of consequences for offshore structures. Uh, what is that? Pollution. Yes, uh, it goes to the environment. Yeah. There are environmental consequences. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, very uh, uh, decision analysis uh, should include the consequences which are relevant in the decision scenario. Uh, I think this is uh, also very, uh, very important orientation. Uh, this is without uh, our analysis uh, we are doing, but uh, we need a solid decision uh, scenario uh, to properly model. Uh, or probably develop models, also the consequence models. Okay, yes. thank you very much for the question. Yes, please. I don't understand why in that uh, flow chart uh, there is not the structural response also before the actions. I mean, I have the outcomes from the structural health monitoring then I do not need the, the structural response uh, and then uh, the actions and then again the structural response is. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. The, um, it's it's, more it's it just illustrates the decision scenario and not uh, what you do after and before. Ah, okay. That's, okay. that's in your models. No, but also in your decision you always have the option to do nothing. And that means to remain at the state as you have been before. You yes. can have a, a decision, uh, a decision, and then you make different decisions, and you can do nothing, and that means you nothing changes, right? So therefore, you always consider that option too. Yes. Yeah. But I cannot understand how you can decide not to do anything if you cannot have a, a model of you, you always have it all together. You have it all together. It's uh, just illustrating <coughs> the decision uh, scenario. Uh, of course, uh, your uh, SHM outcomes will influence the structural performance. And uh, so basically the reliabilities. So SHM may reduce uh, the uncertainties, so, it will, uh, so the, there will be a reliability increase, uh, increase against failure. It could be a risk reduction. And um, And basically, uh, only if you know uh, what the risk reduction uh, is, if you have quantified it, you can decide what actions uh, you should take. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's not contradicted by this uh, decision tree. It's just illustrating um, yeah, the decision analysis, as I said, it contains uh, many elements. But uh, it uh, does not contain the consequences, and the temporal modeling uh, or the this, uh, scenario you described, it's in the models then. Another question? Where should we define, for example, if we are making some type of SGM, uh, should we define the threshold values for each action? You know, if we measure the flexion and we have, yeah. for example, if you're at some bridge, okay. first one action is do nothing, second one traffic uh, weight restriction, third uh, one strengthening, and fourth one replacement. Should we yeah. have? How do you define the thresholds uh, without this? Okay, but uh, that's why I'm asking. Should we should define thresholds? No, 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 no. Uh, let's uh, let's think. How do you define thresholds? Based on, the, on structural performance. Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm asking the same question. Yes, exactly. And, and the structural performance, uh, and uh, you're defining the threshold because you have the structural performance, but and you have the reliability requirement. 
or a design check requirement, right, yes. uh, in deterministic terms, and then you get out the threshold. Okay. Uh, and, and now we do the same, but we, uh, we are modeling explicitly the uh, event of uh, failure, where you got the threshold from, but we describe just the uh, event uh, of, uh, of failure, and we have our SHM outcomes, uh, and uh, so you can imagine that we that we uh, work with a probabilistic threshold somehow uh, in in our models. Okay, I understand that. For mm -hmm. example, let's say it be reliability index, but uh, how if uh, if it defines the action, how can the action be before the same thing for the class? For example, yeah, you're uh, yeah okay. Uh, we have have to have a few steps to take. Um, so uh, this threshold determination is deterministic. We would first need to go to probabilistics, and we need to uh, model the uh, probabilistic events uh, here. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is one step, uh, and then. Um, it's a decision analysis, and ah, we didn't talk about it, um, but I heard it. Um, how do we identify the optimal decision? Uh, so we would like to find the uh, best SHM system and also the most appropriate action, but how do we identify it? <coughs> you mean what, what's it right here, right? Yes, or we could call it an objective function. Yeah. Yes. And what goes in there? No, Medan, do not. Yes, please. Go ahead. The objective function usually is money. <laughs> yes. But this is only this is only one ingredient. It's the money. It's the consequences. Yeah, but it's in more general terms. Can be quantified with money. Pardon. All the consequences can be quantified. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's right. I just want to introduce oil the... Oil spill? An oil spill? Some of the penalties? Yeah. The money? Yes. What, 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 how, you, what, how, how do you quantify yeah. some of the penalties? How much is it? Uh, for example, if you have an insurance and for insurance... <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now you are yeah. ethically very, very... Uh, <laughs> But this is dependent on the country. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, so uh, you, you already know. You already know uh, how it how it is done. But what are the underlying models and how they should should be scientifically? It goes to the life quality index. Uh, so the uh, that's a way of uh, being able to determine uh, the or to assign a mon monetary number to uh, human life. Uh, but we don't go into this. Uh, let's stay with the consequences. Uh, okay, we, let's say we have uh, money or we have a number of fatalities. Uh, but we still don't know how our, uh, that's not complete for identifying uh, our uh, best decision. What is the other ingredient? Yes, it's the probabilities. So it's the probabilities of the consequences or the expected consequences. And this is what, is, uh, what our objective function is about. And uh, this is how you uh, identify the actions. If you so lately work with thresholds, uh, coming back to your question, uh, then uh, you circumvent the decision analysis. And you will never know, um, was it uh, optimal in terms of expected consequences or not? And of course, you can take out uh, all of the expected consequences, also uh, cost estimates. But you need to be aware that it's, uh, that we always work with the probabilities times the consequence. And this is our optimal decision uh, about. And this is a pre-posterior decision analysis. So we always have the situation, so talking about the basic element of the decision scenario, we are here, and we have to decide now about uh, the future, about the service life of a structure. 25 years for a wind turbine, 50, 100 years for a bridge. 
So, uh, and we can do this with the pre-posterior decision analysis in a very consistent manner, and we can even optimize uh, before uh, going out and implement. Okay, uh, I think this was the first lecture. <laughs>